Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Morton. My pronouns are she, her. I am the artist and studio manager here at Baltimore Clayworks, and we are thrilled that you have joined us. I would like to acknowledge that I am joining from my office located on Piscataway and Susquehannock land, currently known as Bolinarbor, Maryland. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual artist talk given today by Jenny Reed. She was Baltimore Clayworks Thormina Salter Fellow in 2020 to 2021. And for more information about our artist talks, please visit our virtual library at baltimoreclayworks.org. Now we now turn it over to Jenny. Hi, thank you. I'm Jenny. Um, um, thanks, Rebecca, for having me and inviting me. And thanks to everyone at Clayworks for inviting me. And um, thanks for everyone who has tuned in. I really appreciate uh, that you are interested in my work. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Let's see. All right, does that look okay? Okay, great. Um, all right, so I'm an artist and educator. I currently live in Baltimore and I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. So my practice primarily consists of the creation of ceramic based assemblage sculptures. So let me go ahead and show you um, what exactly that looks like. So I create work that's pretty whimsical. It's really playful, um, a little fanciful. I use a lot of bright colors. And I'm typically creating abstract representations of objects and spaces. I also create um, like symbolic collections of objects that are sometimes like arranged together to create just like a piece. Uh, in this example, it's called Pet Lover's Accent Cabinet. It's a piece that's made mostly with ceramics. So the bottom section is a ceramic base. The middle section is like a ceramic component that has some ceramic pieces coming off and also some collaged paper on it. And then that top part is a woven tapestry. So for this piece, um, I had made this when I was in grad school at Indiana University. And um, I lived in like a very small studio apartment, but um, I had this accent cabinet that I just really loved. It was kind of mid-century modern, very cool. And um, I was looking at it and I was thinking about how I had got this cat and somehow all of the cat's toys and other items like it's like uh, brushes and treats had just sort of overtaken the space. And so I was thinking about how in my living room, this accent cabinet had been this like curated, Thing that I had created to kind of show myself to guests and also to feel comfortable. And I had like a candle on the top of it. Um, but then once I got this cat, he sort of took over the space. And so the cabinet itself is sort of showing the actual space being taken over. This top part is really depicting the space that is actually behind the cabinet. So kind of thinking about how a space is captured from the objects in it, as well as the actual atmosphere of the space. Um, and so I was just thinking about how there's these things that are in your space that um, kind of become embedded. So there's sort of these positive and negative associations where in one breath, um, I have all these items now that are just clutter and I almost don't even recognize them as part of the space because it's like not what I've curated. But then the positive to that is that I have all these objects that are really um, an example of like me and how I'm trying to show like love and care to something. I'm really interested in those um, positive negative associations of things and trying to capture that and really showing these like moments where I have like a sense of reflection um, that kind of break up the monotony of like day to day. So I think of them as like mundane moments or magic moments that are often inspired from like looking around often in like a space that I'm really used to, but then it just feels like I see it in a different way where I have a certain internal experience um, with that space. 
So all my work is sculpture and specifically, I would say it's assemblage sculpture. So what that means to me is that I am very purposeful with what materials I'm using and I'm trying really hard um, to make it obvious in the end result what materials are being shown. So I'm kind of combining different things together. Um, hopefully so viewers can kind of come up with their own conceptual connotations of what the materials can do or what they mean. I really relate to the term bricolage. Bricolage is, um, it's like a sociologist sort of term. Um, I first heard about it actually from Garth Clark, who is a ceramic critic. And he writes a lot. He had written an article about Viola Frey, if you know her work. She was a famous ceramic sculptor. And he spoke of her as a bricoler, which is someone who um, is kind of constructing um, some sort of creation from a diverse range of available objects. So usually it's someone who isn't really looking for a certain material far and wide. It's more so what they have around. Uh, Garth Clark explained it as like in between a shaman and a handyman, which I thought was really funny. And that's what I often do in my work. So um, this piece, for example, I had made this um, during the pandemic. So I was um, in school and I was predominantly working with ceramics at the time, but then I lost access to my ceramic studio. And so I was still trying to make work and figuring out how to do that um, while being trapped at home and not really having uh, much access to different materials or space. And so I started creating this tapestry and um, I was using like a bag of clothes that I had meant to donate that were still at my house. I was like cutting up aluminum cans to make different beads on the work. So I just really appreciate when um, I'm using what's around and then using that in a way to try to create something new. So beyond just assemblage pieces and that process, there are a few other reoccurring aspects throughout my work. One is this use of these hands-on processes and specifically craft-based processes. So um, that has to do with ceramics. It has to do with fiber, which is kind of increasingly becoming more prominent in my work. I learned how to weave um, probably about Ooh, like four years ago now. And so um, that's been a big um, inspiration for me, as well as just like sewing. I've done some paper making in the past and I'm currently learning candle making. So I really like these uh, processes that are really based on um, just like craft um, and thinking of craft as like a verb. So making a thing in a particular way and really valuing that um, repetition in a process and sort of like learning through doing. Uh, craft materials, to me, they have a lot of conceptual connotations inherently that kind of relate to the work. So one thing would be like the domestic space um, has that connection. There's also this idea um, with ceramics specifically of like recording or having like a sense of record in the material as well as like throughout history. Um, and also like the low brow. So I won't throw too many names at you, but I've also been reading this book by um, Glenn Adamson. It's called Craft in American History. It's really great. Um, and he's, he's basically starting from like when um, America began like all the way into present day and he's sort of talking about that history through the lens of craft and where craft was in America or how it was thought of. Um, so in it he talks about how craft is like a myth in a sense in American history um, and specifically he's kind of relating to these certain values that craft still has uh, these connotations to today. So um, there was a lot of, when America started, there was a lot of Protestant values um, that were considered really important, like um, being like self-sufficient. 
and um, being individual and being able to like take care of yourself. And also like the idea of labor itself, it was seen as like you were a more virtuous person if you put in effort or labor. And so thinking about craft in that way, I think is really interesting. Um, there's kind of like two thoughts going on because sometimes craft compared to like uh, an oil painting or a sculpture made out of marble might be considered lowbrow or less than, but at the same time, in terms of American history, we have this connection to craft where we think that it like can make you, it has the potential to actually make you a better person in some way. And so I think that's really interesting. So I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Another aspect of my work that is seen reoccurring is um, this like fun or playfulness. Um, this is in the work as well as in the process. So when I'm combining all these different materials together, for me, that's like very exciting. And um, it's very playful. It's a little bit risky. I'm not um, trying to have like an idea of a finished piece before I begin it, it kind of like evolves and changes. And I think about like, well, what if I added this? Or um, that's usually how it goes really is, what if I added this? And then I keep adding and adding, sort of like uh, the way a collage works where you start off and you're gluing down paper and then you slowly add more and more. So um, this is more of a recent piece, the B-Day Blues. Um, it's not so much that uh, I was like, thinking about what exactly the piece would be. I was kind of creating it intuitively with this idea of form in mind and trying to think of a really interesting form and also trying to think of like a form that is funny or like could a form itself just be funny. Um, and so I thought of a foot for that. A foot is kind of funny. Um, I also use like color and color as well as a way to have some humorous elements. So I'm trying to use color in a way that's almost garish. Um, they look maybe almost too bright in a way that could be cheap. So I'm thinking about what is funny. I think that my work is almost funny, which to me is very funny. <laughs> I'm also really interested in time and like the idea of time as a categorization tool. So um, in my work, I think a lot about the present and what exactly the present means. Like, what is it? Is it 2023? Is it like the 2020s? Is it today? Is it March? What is it? And like, how there's kind of a fluctuation in terms of the present, like thinking about moments to moments, as well as like whatever present day could mean. Um, so definitely interested in this idea of these certain moments that kind of switch things up a little bit for people or make them um, just sort of recognize their own autonomy and maybe um, has like some sort of effect where um, you just become sort of appreciative of your life and the things you see and what is surrounding you. Um, more so recently, I've also been interested um, thinking about the future and really challenging myself to try to think of like what a hopeful future would like visually look like. And kind of related to that question, I um, try to challenge myself to think about what are things that are considered acceptable right now that maybe in history will be considered horrendous and what that says about the present or how we think about it. Um, so for this piece, I had made this when <clears throat> the pandemic was like really going on very strongly beginning of 2021. Um, so there was lots of death happening and also the George Floyd murder had just happened. So there was just lots of unrest and um, just like a lot of sadness too. And so around this time, there was a company that made um, Uncle, it's called Uncle Ben's, that's the name. And it was making ready rice. So you might've seen it. It had a pretty iconic um, 
label, but it was like based on a racial stereotype. And so finally in 2021, I think, or maybe 2020 at the end of it, um, they chose that they were going to get rid of that icon because they decided that was not relevant anymore and was hurtful. But thinking about how that happened at this time um, was just interesting to me. So I um, made this piece where that part is sort of fading out. I've also made work about the past and thinking about nostalgia. So um, for example, this piece, I had made this, I had moved back to Louisville after I had went to college and um, I was working at this community art center that I had actually went to when I was a kid. And so when I was a kid, I had remembered that they had this huge utility sink that I could not reach. And when I went back and worked there, I realized that it was just a normal utility sink, but I had the memory of it from the body of like a four-year-old. And so I chose to recreate that and change the scale so that I would have the same experience with this piece. So I was really interested in thinking about the past and kind of how, as you think about it, it can change or like how much your memories of something is uh, close or not close to how things really are. So I was kind of hinting at this already, but um, I was really fortunate to um, be introduced to ceramics at an early age. A lot of that was through um, taking classes at community centers in Louisville, but um, it was also really through my mom. So when I was growing up, my mom was taking ceramic community art classes. And um, it just so happened then that I, clay was always kind of something I was around. Um, and it's just kind of been something that has continued to be this like material that is really significant in my life. Um, so I think about ceramics and like how it's been um, the way that I've sort of worked through things um, throughout my life. Currently, it's kind of, for me, I'm really inspired, I think, personally to make work because I'm trying, when I'm making work, I'm kind of thinking about um, how I can end up feeling a sense of like pointlessness, like just in life in general. Um, I just kind of have that tendency where I feel like things are like, um, I don't know, like there's like this monotony to like day-to-day -day life and like the stress of that. Um, and also how there's just like these like larger problems that are sort of looming around or like, you know, they're always background noise. Sometimes they're more in the forefront depending on what's going on and just feeling like there's not much I can do about it. So for me, making art has always been a way that I'm giving myself time to really just sort of reflect on that feeling and um, not necessarily creating solutions where um, I'm coming up with ideas of specifically how I am going to change the world beyond making art, but um, I am like finding like a different sense of acceptance through it, just through like having the time to um, think about it. So I've always loved ceramics. Um, I've also always incorporated other materials. In undergrad, I went to Northern Kentucky University and I was taught by Anna England. So Anna is also a ceramic artist who incorporates other materials. I think from growing up, going to these community centers where I wasn't really taught like an academic hierarchy of materials or um, an idea that there's like specific categories for, for, spe for specific materials or mediums. Um, it just wasn't something that I really thought about much when I created work. And I think about it now, but I think I'm still pretty open in that way, just from those initial ways that I was introduced to ceramics and art. Um, so I work really intuitively and um, there's not much ingrained, I guess, um, in my hangups about materials. 
So even though I am using all these different materials, I still think about clay and think through clay first. So often I think of working with ceramics as like making the skeleton or like the bare bones of whatever idea it is that I have that I'm trying to do. Um, often ceramic artists will think of firing the piece as like, it's complete, it's wonderful, it's done. Um, for me, firing the piece is like the first step to this long road of getting things complete. So I'll add other materials, I'll do different surface firing or finishing. Um, the firing is just really kind of the beginning of the end for me. So there's lots of different reasons that I incorporate a variety of materials. Often it's just like um, something conceptual that's going on with the piece where I feel like other materials have their own connotations that would be helpful. Um, it can also just be because I have this really um, intense fascination with texture. So I really like um, creating different textures in my work um, both physical texture and implied. I think that I want the work to actually be touching and I want people to want to touch the work. So I'm also just trying to combine these different textures. Um, in this example, I was playing with the idea of how I could switch materials um, between hard and soft. So instead of uh, using like a hard material like ceramic to depict this head, I used sewing. And then instead of using soft materials to show this pile of laundry, I used ceramics. Ceramics has that connection to like record and like recorded history. So I thought it made sense to make this pile of clothes um, that's kind of showing the record of what you've been wearing all stacked up together. Um, I also was thinking a lot about this piece of work to the right. This is a famous uh, sculpture in Western art. It's of uh, Laocoon. It's a Greek mythology story. And so it's him and his sons being attacked by snakes. And so I used um, the pain and anguish in his face to try to create the face in mine. And uh, I was also thinking about for this piece, how uh, that anguish that we see in his face probably also has to deal with like the pain he's experiencing of his sons also being in distress. And so I was thinking about how nurturing that is. And so I tried to switch what he looks like into this more feminine style by using these pink different fabrics. I also use a lot of abstraction in my work. So part of the reason that I use abstraction is because I'm trying to show that I'm not just simply recreating a space or an object. I'm really trying to like put as much energy and feeling and a particular mood into the piece. Um, I'm also trying to show that I'm showing like how moments are sort of floating around and they kind of create what we think of as the present. So often I'll incorporate multiple viewpoints of the actual objects on the work so that it's almost like what it would look like as you were walking around it and seeing different viewpoints. All right, one of the last things that I'll talk about in terms of inspiration for my practice um, is community. So I have been so lucky that I came to Baltimore for Baltimore Playworks and became part of a great community here. Um, I currently teach at Hood and at Loyola, and I just love that interaction of being able to talk to other people and share what I know about art and also to, um, be able to hear what other people think about art and what they think about about everything really. Um, I've been really lucky also that I've been able to participate in a lot of different residencies and workshops. Um, I've visited a lot of different craft schools throughout the country. This is an image of me at Penland. This past winter I did a two-week residency 
in their ceramic studio. And it was just so nice to meet this new group of people um, who are all really committed to their practice and to just talk about how they think about art and how they think about ceramics and how they think about life and just hear all these different perspectives. And it's always just kind of a source of inspiration to me, being able to be part of these different communities. Um, and it kind of allows me to think of my own practice and art in different ways. So this is the last project itself that I will talk about. Um, this is a piece well, this is kind of a whole project that I had started last year and I got support through the Maryland State Arts Council to make this dream a reality. So I had this long-standing goal in my practice of how I could make work that engaged community or audience in a way that was different than just viewing the work. Um, I really wanted to try to figure out how I could make work um, that could have more of a direct impact or more involvement from an audience. Um, but at the same time, I'm kind of uh, strongholding my own practice. I don't necessarily want to create other, I don't really want to create work with other people where we're like collaborating in that sort of way. Specifically, I just didn't think that would really work for what I wanted to do in my practice. And so, I had came up with this project where instead I would create these works um, that were meant to be drawn. And so they were sculpted in specific ways to help with uh, drawing perspective. And so I created, this is a project, it's called uh, Community Installation Drawing the Still Life. So last summer, I set up um, this installation at RimFest in Remington in Baltimore. And so I had like these lemons that are at the top. And then I had a few different novelty toys that I had recreated out of play. And I encouraged people that would walk by to stop by and draw. And so I had all these, I had all kinds of paper and materials and little like um, lap easels that people could use. And it ended up just being a really great time. And I think it kind of gave people an excuse to draw because there was something that they could do. So there wasn't the excuse that they couldn't think of what to draw. It was right there for them. And it had been sculpted in ways that hopefully would be interesting for them to draw if they wanted to draw specific parts of it. Um, and also helpful in a way where there are different components that were obvious. The one on the left was made to appear like it's on a table. So if someone were to draw that piece exactly as they see it, it's more naturally going to be in correct perspective where it looks three-dimensional. Um, and so anyway, this was just a really exciting project to me. And I envision that I'm gonna continue this project. I wanna keep creating different objects for it. I had focused on making a Benita still life, which is a still life that's inspired by symbols that have to do with recognizing that you're going to die. Um, and kind of coming to terms with that and like um, just how, um, I don't know, fragile life is. So I imagine creating more of those objects and setting this up in different communities so that other people can see it too. Last thing I'll say, I have an upcoming show. Um, it's at Art Space in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, it starts April 28th and I really hope that you can come. So at this point, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know.